All right. Thank you all for coming today. Uh, um, how many people uh, flew into Portland or drove more than, say, 100 miles to get here? Wow, wow. <laughs> I, uh, Portland is my hometown. I was born in a hospital a couple miles north of here. Went to high school a couple miles south of here. Went to the University of Oregon. So I'm a local guy. Thank you all for coming all the way here for this conference. It's been a great conference, and uh, here we are finally to the end of it, almost. Um, I, I'm kind of new to using open source software. It's been a few years, and this latest project has been the most intensive thing I've ever done with open source. And I think the, um, the power above everything to me is the quality. The, and that's the uh, passion of the people de you know, developing the open source software, just to make sure that it retains that very high quality and it makes it just wonderful to use. A um, little bit about myself. Uh, I started developing software actually about 37 years ago. Um, I've done, I did some CAD CAM in the early days, uh, mechanical CAD systems, where we drew vectors on a screen before there was pixels. Um, integrated circuit CAD. Uh, I've spent 28 years doing different kinds of embedded development from 3D computer graphics systems to things like live television and video processing for, for example, this projector might have some of my firmware in it. Um, and uh, also 2D and 3D printing. And uh, in my uh, current job, I've been there about three and a half years and I'm leading the uh, investigation into uh, Xenomai. Uh, so today, I'll go over a little bit about 3D printing technology and I'm passing around some 3D parts those were printed um, on the printer that we developed locally here just a few miles south of Portland in Wilsonville is where the 3D Systems branch office is that develops this print technology. Um, so there's some parts going around. Um, I'll do an overview of Xenomai. Uh, to re maybe some of you, it's just a refresher. Maybe some of you are new to it. Uh, I'll give a typical use case, in this case, a, a PCI device driver. Um, and I'll tell you about my practical experience, uh, basically taking uh, an existing very large code base that has been out in, uh, running software that's out in the field, that's been through lots of hardening iterations, that's running on commercial RTOS, and taking that code and running it on, on Xenomai under Linux. Um, and then hopefully there'll be some time for questions. Um, I work for 3D Systems. It was founded, actually, over 30 years ago by the inventor of stereolithography. And that's a technology that also uses vectors that takes a laser and draws it in a vector layer by layer by layer building up a plastic part. Um, late, later they developed uh, selective laser sintering, uh, which is again a vector based uh, layer. Uh, and then uh, they started developing, I guess it's 20 years ago, multi-jet printing using an inkjet style printhead, and this is a pixelated technology. And so like these screens here and everything we're used to, everything's pixels, and in the 3D world they call them voxels, but it's basically 2D planes, one after the other. Um, there's lots of different technologies that 3D systems develop, stereolithography, selective laser sintering, the multi-jet printing, color jet printing, uh, digital light processing, which is basically stereolithography, but instead of vectoring a laser, you use a projector and you project UV light to harden the resin. Um, and direct metal printing. Um, most of you, how many people have done 3D printing, maybe have a 3D printer? Probably what you have is uh, the, the fused deposition modeling, uh, FDM type of printer with a, a head that moves around and has a filament. Uh, actually, 3D Systems did offer one of those called the Cube, and we no longer offer that. So we actually don't have an FDM uh, printer that we sell today. Um, this is the printer that we developed in Wilsonville. Um, it's multi-jet printing. It uses a, a print head that has hundreds of jets, 880 individual jets firing at something around 40 kilohertz. And so these little nanoparticles of material are being laid down in a layer of voxels and layer after layer till you build up the part. Um, we 
uh, we take as our input a 3D model. And internal to the printer, we geometrically sl create slices, and those slices are those pixelated layers or voxelated layers. Um, so there's parts of that layer that's air, parts of it that are the plastic material, and parts of it that are the support material that are laid down to support the parts that might overhang. Um, and the support material that we use in our technology is a soft wax, and it can just be melted away. So that's very convenient for sort of post-processing. You don't have to break off little bits or do anything. You just heat it up a little bit, the wax melts away, and you end up with your part. Um, Here's a, a video that uh, our marketing department put together to talk about this technology a little bit more graphically. So you can see how it's sliced into layers. And then we have our print head with the uh, hundreds of individual jets firing something like 35,000 or 40,000 times per second, laying down millions and millions of little droplets. Building it up with wax to support the parts that overhang and plastic for the part. And there's a lamp that fires to harden the plastic. And I think the rest of this video shows how easy it is to replace the material. <laughs> so just pop it out, put in the new material. Each jug is only a few hundred dollars, so it's very inexpensive. <laughs> this is, these printers are um, intended for like an industrial use, typically. So uh, very high resolution devices, uh, very high resolution parts that are printed. Um, and they can also be used to create uh, castings for metal. It's uh, one of the big uses. Um, also dental, they're used to produce uh, dental, uh, like crowns and things like that. <clears throat> and the power of this 3D printing, even though it may take many, many hours to complete your part through the 3D printer, uh, to mechanical designers, that's way, way faster than the maybe multiple week turnaround times they would get to actually get prototypes that they can test for fit and uh, usability and things like that. But you can kind of tell by looking at this, imagine all the real-time systems that are here. And, um, and these systems um, include motion control of all the different motors, the thermal control, there's things have to be heated up, some things have to be cooled down. The curing of the resin is an exothermic process, so we have to get rid of that heat. Um, we have material delivery, delivery, so we're sensing the levels in the print head and, and in the bottles and things like that, and we have to pump it, pump it through and open up valves and gates. And uh, the print head itself has to be controlled and we, uh, to control the jet fire and the data load and uh, the before printing calibration things. And, uh, and also, uh, as the data comes in, it has to be reorganized because the printhead has an interesting geometry of orifices. And as, that, as those jets are firing during the motion, you need to organize all your pixels so they're in the right place at the right time. It's not just a simple FIFO or something that, where you just push the pixels through. You have to reorganize them in real time. Uh, now, in this case, also, while all this real-time stuff is going on, we're running this slicer that's taking this big geometric object, very potentially a very complex geometric object, and geometrically slicing it and figuring out what might be above it, does it need a support, and you know, what are the boundaries of it, and all that. So that's, the slicer is, in, is very... Uh, compute intensive, it uses lots of RAM, it uses lots of uh, floating point, um, and it pretty much takes over the processor. In our current systems, um, we have a Windows uh, PC, basically, that's running the slicer that's embedded PC in the, in the printer. And then we have another uh, PowerPC 32-bit controller that runs a commercial RTOS that runs all the real-time systems. So, 
for my project, my technology assessment, and this is not for any particular product to go out the door yet, but just to see, is it possible? Can we run this hard real-time controller uh, control on, a, on the same controller that we're doing the compute bound slicing? And that's a, a fairly big challenge, and we uh, chose Linux with Xenomai, and Xenomai, specifically the co-kernel version of Xenomai, because that provides us this hard real-time capability even on a system that's heavily loaded. Um, and you can imagine these print jobs, some of the big print jobs might take a day, 30 hours. And if 29 hours into it, you miss a deadline and you have to abort the print, that's not gonna make the customer very happy. So we really absolutely need hard real-time response and it has to be extremely reliable. Um, in our early development, we had a secret weapon and that was Philippe Jerome, he's the originator of Xenomai, as far as I know. Uh, he's one of the main contributors to it. Uh, and he also does consulting. So we hired him to kind of get ourselves kick-started because personally, I, I'm not that familiar with open source development and I'm definitely not that familiar with Xenomai. I read some of the documentation, but having Philippe along kind of give us a quick kick-start. We gave him all our embedded code and he kind of massaged it into, into Linux land for us. Um, he created this auto tools based build environment, which is um, what Xenomai currently uses. And so that was the natural thing for him to do for us. Um, we could also do CMake or whatever, but it's, we use, we're using auto tools. And he uh, delivered these uh, real time driver model drivers and API functions to access the drivers um, based on this original code that we gave him. And again, what he originally gave us was kind of uh, an example that we used, and then we looked at it, examined it, and then kind of threw it away and started over. Um, and actually, this was a great way to get started, but anybody here who's interested in doing a Xenomai project, you don't have to hire the leap. You, there's great, there is pretty good documentation, and there's great user community support, and um, when you get the Xenomai download, it has like example programs and test programs and things that you can look at as examples. And if you've done kernel development, you'll be a lot more comfortable doing it. Um, so to get started, you have to make a decision. In Xenomai 3, you have the choice, Mercury or Cobalt. Mercury is single kernel. Cobalt is the co-kernel. What most people think of when they hear Xenomai is this co-kernel. But uh, if you don't have any hard real-time constraints uh, and you just want to use the libraries that Xenomai provides, then you can use Mercury and you can put that on any kernel and you can have the preempt RT patch and you can then get the benefits of the libraries, some of them like that emulate VxWorks or emulate PSOS and some of the other um, libraries like that. If you're hard real-time, then you want Cobalt uh, you patch the kernel with this thing called IPipe, this interrupt pipeline that basically uh, takes over uh, handling the interrupts so that you get that real-time response. Uh, and then you want to select a Linux distribution that's compatible with whatever uh, patch you're going to use. <clears throat> and also note that uh, the, the single kernel is only on Xenomai 3, so if you're familiar with Xenomai 2, that was only the co-kernel. So uh, Mercury is new in Xenomai 3. Um, so you start with the, getting the uh, kernel source. And after being to this conference for three days, I think everybody knows how to get a kernel from kernel.org. <laughs> uh, or you can, in this case, I'm running an Ubuntu uh, distribution, and I can just grab the source for that distribution. Um, and the, if I do the first method, um, I can get the version of the kernel that exactly matches the, the patch that I want to apply. Now, I could take a chance and try to apply a patch that's close to the version I have with my distribution, and I've heard that may work, but um, I've only tried it the first way, and it's worked really well for me. So uh, this is an example when you go to xenomai.org and you see the different patches that are available. You can see the kernel versions here that are for x86 version four of the kernel, the different uh, kernels that uh, the patch will be applied to. Um, so um, if, 
for example, we, we were using an Ubuntu distribution just to get started. Uh, we started with 14.04, and then wait, later we moved to 16.04, and so um, we upgraded to a newer patch when we changed uh, the distributions. Um, to get to Xenomai source, you can clone it right from uh, xenomai.org, uh, or uh, they also have tarballs that you can download and then put onto your system. Um, I like cloning the repository with Git. You get the updates. You can, you can, there's a stable branch, and you can pull from the stable branch and get the latest updates as you're going along. Uh, or you can, even if you use the Git source, there's a tags, and you can check out a tag and just work off a tag also. Um, so Xenomai, like I said, is using auto tools. So if you're familiar, if you've done auto tools builds, and I think people that do work in Linux probably have a lot of exposure to this, typically bootstrap, and that creates a configure file. You run configure, then you just say make and make install, and then you've got Xenomai is now built, but it's not in your kernel yet. You've just got the executables of Xenomai and the libraries of Xenomai built. Um, then you want to go get the IPipe patch, whichever one corresponds to your kernel. Um, they recommend using wget. Sometimes I'm having trouble with wget, and I read somewhere that curl is more reliable, and I've had success with curl, but occasionally I've had failures trying to use curl to get it, and I don't know why, but it's a network thing. Uh, either one works. Um, generally, curl, I found, is more reliable. Um, then there's a prepare kernel script, and you run that, and then you configure the kernel. And for me, and I'm, I haven't done kernel development much before, I've done a little bit of uh, driver development in a project where there was already a driver and it just needed modification, and I didn't have to configure anything or whatever. I just look at the code and see where it needs to be modified and rebuild the kernel, and it was pretty easy. In this case, I had to configure. And when you first come up, you'll see something with lots of scary warnings saying, oh, uh, if you have page migration on, that may increase your latency, and you might probably want to turn that off. And I had to learn how to use the slash search for term in menu config and find what page it's on and turn it off. So if you're familiar with menu config, it'll probably be really easy for you. Um, it was a little bit of an adventure for me. And, uh, um, but this is a kind of a one-time thing. You get started, you configure your kernel, and then you're good to go after that. Um, and, uh, and I learned a lot about how to configure a kernel by going through this process, so it was all good. Uh, and then you just make install like you would normally do with a kernel. You, once you've done your config, you just say make, you know, and install. And oh, I usually put a local version in, so you can like put a little, some number of characters, so when you say uname-r, you can kind of see, oh yeah, I'm running the, the special Xenomai version that I wanted to. And then you can, then the next thing typically you can do is just to make sure that your kernel is actually patched properly. You can run this latency script and you get some nice numbers out of it. Uh, it kind of gives you this warning. I built with debug and so I have quote unquote high latencies which are like in the 40s and 50s. So that was pretty, pretty much okay with me. Um, and uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that when you build a, a Xenomai application, even if you build it as user Fred, you have to do sudo run your application as super user so, uh, to get into the, into the Xenomai libraries. So now you've got your kernel up, um, and it's got the co-kernel. You've got the Cobalt core there. And then you've got these RTDM, real-time driver model drivers. Um, and then you have some libraries on the user space side that your application can call into to get to those drivers. And, um, so uh, the real-time driver model, this is, um, this is uh, intended to be a unified interface for both users and developers of real-time drivers. And um, it's the Xenomai programming interface, and it was, uh, also, it's also used by this real-time application interface, RTAI, out of Italy. Um, and when you create a device, with RTDM, it's in this dev RTDM structure. Um, there's RTDM functions in the kernel to register 
um, IRQ handlers. Uh, there's ways to actually register your devices. And here's a typical use case for a PCI device. So let's say you have um, an FPGA somewhere and it's, and it's on a PCIe bus. And so you, when you boot up, the Linux will go out there and kind of probe the PCIe bus and, and then uh, you can basically get called back and say, hey, uh, here's this device that matches the vendor and device ID that, that you want. And then this is just standard Linux. There's no Xenomai in here at all. This is just standard PCI driver stuff where you want to enable the device and request the regions and um, uh, get the start address of the bar and um, maybe I.O. remap the bar um, into memory map space. And, um, but then once you have all that, then you can call this RTDM function and you just say, I want this handler to be called whenever this interrupt happens. And that handler is going to be called in this real-time domain. And um, so um, this is how you register the, uh, the device. So you can create a class, and then uh, you, you can use these RTDM functions, again, to set the system class and register the device. And this is with an RTDM device um, data structure, and then you then uh, you want to set up the, de uh, the device structure which references the driver structure, and that gives you the, basically the, the path to your device that you want to open and send write commands and read commands from and all that stuff. Um, so a little more detail. This is the RTDM driver structure, and you set it up with uh, what, what kind of device it is. And the kind of the key thing here, at least for me, is that there are real-time and non-real-time versions of things like I.O. control and read and write. Um, and so uh, you can, your device can act as a real-time device, but it can also act as a non-real-time device at the same time, the same device. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that um, if you're going to have a process that's going to be accessing the non-real-time part of it, you don't want it to lock. You don't want it to lock the parts of your device that the real-time is going to want to access. That could be a bad uh, collision there. Um, you can also create a POSIX-compatible clock. So, let's say your device has a hardware clock. Uh, you just write these functions to read the ticks, um, convert the ticks to nanoseconds. Uh, or just read the ticks as nanoseconds, or read monotonic in nanoseconds, um, to be able to you know, set the time to a specific value in nanoseconds, uh, convert nanoseconds to ticks, and ticks back to nanoseconds, and then ticks to nanoseconds with rounding, and program local shot and global shot, which is basically saying, this is when I want to wake up. So this is the, the time in nanoseconds when I want to get my interrupt. And you, this is how you do that. You write a function that do, do that. You populate that in a data structure uh, called a, a XN clock or Xenomai clock. You, po you just give the pointers to those functions. Um, and then uh, in your interrupt handler, you want to call this Xenomai clock tick. And that's basically going to, um, uh, when you get when you get a wake up interrupt, it's going to do what's necessary to wake up any waiting threads or uh, kernel processes. Um, uh, then you you register it, and again, this is uh, you know my cobalt clock register. You give it the XN clock structure, and you get back a POSIX clock ID, and then you can use that clock ID in these basically what look like POSIX functions: the so timer create, timer set time, clock now to sleep, just looks just like POSIX. And, um, so that's, that's very nice to be able to essentially have a, a real-time clock um, that's your hardware that you can access like you're used to doing with POSIX. Um, write a user space application. Here's the nice thing. Once you've got, got all this set up, then this, to me, this was kind of like an eye-opener. I did not realize that in Xenomai that most of my hard real-time stuff is going to be happening in user space. I thought all of my hard real-time stuff was going to happen in the kernel, but that's not the case at all. Very little actually is happening in the kernel. All the hard real-time stuff that's 
doing everything. It's happening in user space and user space threads. Uh, so you, you create your user space thread and you open your device that you created, in this case, the, case, the FPGA control. Um, you maybe read and write stuff to it to get it to do things. Um, there's also a real-time thread create. So you, in our case, we create a couple dozen, probably 30, maybe even 40 threads that are all doing motion control and thermal control and material delivery and head setup and data control and all these other things. Um, and so with all these threads running, we, uh, there's real-time mutexes. There's condition variables, which we use as a way to pass information back and forth between the different threads. Um, and when you get it going, this is a case where so you can see this old dusty printer they gave us. We just ripped out its brains <laughs> and just left the hardware alone. And we put in this x86 PC, basically. It was just a little motherboard, a little x86 motherboard. The motherboard cost us 50 bucks, and we got a processor and some RAM and plugged in the PCI bus to the, to the printer. And here we're running three different axes. We're running a, a head maintenance axis, a Z table of going up and down, and then the print head moving left and right. So that was just an early example of like, hey, I can actually, not only can I control this motor in you know, real time, but um, I can have three of them running at once, and then more and more, and we kept adding and adding, and we just basically took this huge, uh, you know, with, I don't know, decades of, of development, uh, person hours, um, developing the embedded control code for the 3D printer. And again, this printer is shipping. This is a printer that's shipping you can buy today that uses a different kind of controller. And that code that's been hardened by going to customers, finding bugs, going through QA cycles and release cycles, and it's a very well hardened code, this is now running on Linux with Xenomai. So we were able to I uh, print a beautiful looking part. And uh, it was actually a big surprise. Um, along the way, uh, we uh, ran into some problems. And um, these are kind of problems if you're doing Xenomai, you may run into yourself. Um, just want to check the time here. I guess we've got plenty of time left. Good. Um, so thread relaxes. So um, your threads run, primary mode is the real-time mode, secondary is running just like a Linux, any Linux thread. And this is really nice, actually, because if you need to do something in the Linux world, you just do it. And the thread becomes the Linux character, and it runs in non-real-time mode, and it does its thing. And then when you come back and you access your real-time functions, boom, it pops back into primary mode, and it's a real-time thing. If you want it to always be real-time, don't call those other Linux functions. Uh, but um, when you transition from primary to secondary, it's called a relax. And sometimes you have a spurious relax. It's because something happened uh, that caused it to go into secondary mode, but you weren't really expecting it to. Uh, and these actually are, you get notified by Xenomai um, if you look at the syslog, you'll see, um, you know, relax on this thread. And that's very useful. And there's another um, utility that, where you can turn on and get a, a log of all the relaxes and get tracebacks of where the relax happened. And so this is very, very useful. Um, an example where this could happen is, let's say, and we're doing all this code, almost all this code is C++, by the way. Um, this embedded control code was all developed in C++. Uh, so it's kind of handy to use a collection class, and then if you start adding things to the collection class and it needs to grow, if that collection class happens to be on the Linux heap, then it's going to make a call into Linux and you're going to relax into secondary mode. Um, there's, you can create memory pools that are real-time memory pools, which is what we do now, <laughs> but uh, you get these relaxes happening just by saying insert something into a, into a map, and you're like, oh, how'd that relax happen? Um, the other thing is um, if you, you memory map a file and then you have a pointer and you, you're actually accessing the file like you would memory, but the file system is Linux only. You don't get the file system in real-time mode. So 
you'll get a relax, and sometimes just dereferencing that will cause a relax. So in our case, we had this issue where we had a non-volatile parameters, we kept them in a file, we memory mapped that file so we could get to all the parameters like they were in memory, but they were kept in a file so they didn't go away when we rebooted. Um, and every time we uh, read from that memory, that memory, or wrote to that memory, we would get a relax. So they were happening all the time, and it's like, oh, we gotta fix that. Uh, so we made a copy of that memory, and so we just accessed this cache. And then we found this really cool thing called the cross-domain datagram po protocol. It's part of Xenomai, uh, and it's where a primary mode thread can push data out to a secondary mode thread. And so that was nice. When we need to update our file, we push it through this XDDP socket. We never leave primary mode. And the other side never leaves secondary mode. It's reading from this socket. It stays in secondary mode, and it writes to the file in the background, and everybody's happy. And if it's writing to the file, and we need to do something now, Xenomite takes over and does its thing, and we go back to what we were doing. So it's very nice. Uh, that solved it. No more relaxes. No more weird latency issues. It just fixed everything for us. Really nice. Um, we had a, a case where um, we wanted to do a timestamp of some material, like when, when a bottle was put in, and so we wanted to like timestamp when a new bottle was inserted. So we used this get time of day call in the kernel in primary mode, and uh, that works great because you're just reading from a location in memory somewhere the time of day, and it works fine. It's memory access is no problem, but um, sometimes the OS has to update the time of day. And if the OS is updating the time of day, you kind of go into a little spin lock until the OS is done. But the problem is, I'm in primary mode. Linux can't run when I'm spinning. And so Linux can't ever update, so dead. And so we put in this little change to timestamp, and every once in a while, the thing would just die. And so we, when we rolled back the change, that, that lockup went away, so we kind of knew, all right, somewhere in these changes is this problem, and we were to track, track it back to get time of day. And a big help, by the way, was the Xenomai forum. It's like an email forum. If you use Xenomai, sign up for the email forum. It's extremely useful. And uh, just searching through that forum, there was somebody had a similar problem, and to explain the whole thing of what was going on, so, ah, light goes on, I see what's happening. Um, there is a real-time clock get time call as part of Cobalt, and, and there's special type of time called clock host real time, so that was our solution, a just a different way to get the time where we didn't, uh, and that, that's in um, user space, but in uh, kernel space, there's actually an RTDM call that just gives you nanoseconds since the system booted, so that's, that's pretty useful. Um, so, uh, the NK lock is an internal Xenomai lock to kind of protect some of its internal data structures. Um, and so um, we also had our FPGA could have multiple threads accessing it simultaneously. And so we wanted to block out certain references to the FPGA with uh, this RTDM spin lock, uh, which is a very, very useful kind of lock that lets you um, make sure that you're not clobbering yourself on multiple threads running. Um, and so that's how we protect that resource with this RTDM spin lock. It's very simple and easy to use and very, and it works fantastic. Um, and then while we would have the FPGA resource lock, maybe we use the Xenomai select signal to wake, wake up a thread that's waiting on a, on a select. Um, down under the cover somewhere, it for a moment locks this NK lock, internal Xenomai lock, to do its thing for select, and then it unlocks it. And then we come back and we unlock the FPGA. But on the periodic timer, when we enter the periodic timer function, NK lock is already locked. And so then if we lock the FPGA, we get the ABBA locking issue, and boom, uh, it just comes to a screeching halt. And again, there's some nice features, debugging features, where if, you, if your thread goes to sleep or whatever, it, you can like, get notified, it's hey, uh, you were asleep for more than three seconds, why? And it'll just like send you a signal. Um, so to avoid it, we uh, 
we could say that whenever we have the FPGA locked, we just don't use these Xenomyer RTDM functions so that we don't ever have that problem of locking NK lock with FPGA locked. Or um, in the periodic timer function, we just don't lock the FPGA and we only do things in the periodic timer that don't require us to lock the resource. Um, or we could build our own timer interrupt and not use the sort of built-in Xenomai timer feature and then we don't have NK lock locked. We chose the second one. Um, our periodic timer thing was um, like a, uh, a watchdog timer that had, you know, poked a register and we we're the only thing ever poking that watch, watchdog register. So eh, you don't need to lock the FPGA in there. Um, we had this interesting issue um, where in this code base that we inherit, you know, that we brought in, this big code base, um, it has the user space uh, uh, timer capability that's kind of a library function. And so it, it starts up all these timers and when it gets a timer interrupt, it basically says, every timer that was set to go off before now, I'm gonna wake up. Even if maybe this isn't my interrupt, I don't, I don't know that this interrupt was associated with my timer, but I know that it, if the time is T and somebody requested me to wake up before T, I'm gonna wake up all those things. Um, but we had an issue where you say, I wanna wake up at time T and it converts that nanoseconds into ticks, it rounds it down a little bit. So when we finally get woken up, the now time is actually before the time when we wanted to wake up, which is, not unreasonable, but uh, in our case, we wouldn't wake up anybody. We'd say, oh, the timer came in and nobody's waiting, so then we'll wait for the next interrupt, which there never will be one. <laughs> and we would just stop and go, how come the timers aren't going anymore? Uh, that was a pretty easy thing to fix. We just said, oh, when we read the current time, we add one hardware tick in nanoseconds to that now time. What's interesting about this, what I found really interesting is that on our, on our proprietary system, it had the same problem it rounded down and everything the same way. But the latency was big enough that that little bit of rounding down never was a problem because by the time we got into that user space function that compared the now and when I wanted to wake up time, it was always after. It was always after. The, the, the latency was big enough that we never had this problem. And in Xenomai, it was very fast. So yay for Xenomai for being fast. Um, so let's see, we have our entire con uh, embedded control code base, which is actually all hosted with, in Git on our local Git server. It will now run on Linux and Xenomai. That embedded control all runs and we can, we can do everything. We can print and do everything we need to do. The whole code base is running. Uh, the old controller was a 32-bit big Endian machine. The new one is a 64-bit little Indian machine, commercial RTOS, and they're actually compatible. So that's very nice. So we can, we can build, we can actually maintain the two code bases. It's one code base. We can maintain that code base and the two systems together. Um, so the key thing was to bring in the slicer. So we brought in the slicer as this was running on Windows. We built it on just a, as a standard Linux app and we let it rip and it, takes over the whole processor. I mean, it is loading that sucker down, just slicing away as fast as it can. And there was never a problem with the real time. I mean, Xenomai worked extremely well. I've run jobs for two days solid, you know, huge print jobs. There's never a glitch. Um, now, granted, I, as my hardware guy tells me, who's a little bit nervous about you know an unsupported operating system, <laughs> um, it's like, well, we have three printers running now in the lab, and it's like three printers, that's a very small you know, sample, and you've only run it for a few months, and it's like the fact that you've had no problems isn't good enough, you know, but I think it's pretty good. Uh, it's been an extremely uh, successful investigation. Now we have to get past the, oh, what are the legal ramifications of open source software? What, what are the support ramifications? What are the, um, how do we fix problems when we're in production, all these things. But anyway, any, any questions? Yes. Um, 
The question is that we analyze the cost difference, and we have. Um, the Windows license, I'm not exactly sure, but I think it's like around $150 per machine. I'm not sure, don't quote me on that. Well, actually, I think I'm being recorded, so. I, I, do, know, <laughs> I do know that our, our commercial RTOS costs us more than $100 per printer that we ship, more than $100 per printer. So I think our total cost just for licensing is like 250 bucks or more. And this, um, as uh, if you were um, at the uh, open source uh, uh, sort of licensing talk that was here a little bit before me, um, it's, I don't ever want to say that Linux is free. You know, we, there's a cost to it. We want to contribute back to the community, but um, the bean counters will like it. Yeah. Yes. So the question is, why are we running slicing on the same processor that we're doing real-time control? And hey, why do we even need real-time control? Because there's lots of smart motors and other things that don't really need you know, hard latencies. Um, and those are good points. Um, the, uh, the reason to run the slicer on the printer is when it's slicing, it's slicing in a way that is very particular for that device. So it doesn't just slice up the model, uh, it has to slice it into the exact resolution and pixel dimensions and everything that are for that printer or that printer class. Um, it has to understand how the supports fill in and things like that. Now, we could do that on the host computer that is like the, that's driving the printer, it could do all the slicing on that. But what this provides for our customers is they have, we have a thing called 3D Sprint, which is our, our application that runs on your desktop PC or your laptop. You bring in your model, you select the printer you want it to print to, you say go, print. And if you want to start another job, that exact same job on another printer, you just select another printer, you say go, print. And so they may, from one little laptop, be controlling 20 printers that are on their shop floor. Um, that they spent millions of dollars for these printers. <laughs> you know, they're, um, now they could have a separate laptop for every printer, and so each printer has a dedicated laptop, but this, this is something our customers have found to be very useful, and for us, it's uh, less of a maintenance headache. When we release the, the 3D Sprint application, it doesn't have to know anything about how the slicing works. It just has to send the, send the job to the printer and the printer figures out how the slicing works. So that's why we do that. And again, in the current application, we have a Windows slicer, and then we have a separate thing that's running the real-time control separately so they don't have to interact. And we could keep doing that. Our hardware guy really wants us to keep doing that. <laughs> so he wants to develop the next real-time board because that's fun to develop. But um, we'll see how it goes. Um, and then as far as do we really need hard real-time, that is actually a really good question. I went to a couple of talks at this conference that made me kind of question, how, how would this work if we didn't have Xenomai? I suspect that we would get the occasional glitch. Now, um, so part of this is that we're running a, a, an existing code base, like I said, that has a huge legacy history. Um, this code has been developed over a long time with lots of developers. It's very well hardened, and so we, we like to keep this code base active, and it does depend on hard real time. Uh, we've tried, we, we actually tried running it just as an application, and it didn't even come close to working, so. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so the question is, how many slices ahead do we need to be processing um, as we're printing? And um, there's two, th two answers to that. One is the slicer 
um, generally on most parts will run quite a bit faster than the me mechanism can print. So we're getting slicers maybe, we're getting two or three slices per printed slice. And so the slicing gets completed well before the print's done. Uh, in turn, on the embedded side, we have chosen, because, uh, w because this kind of gives us a good amount of buffering, 16 layers. So we, we bring in and we start processing, and we have 16 different threads running the processing we need for the data on 16 layers. Uh, the throughput is way fast enough to handle a layer per printed layer, but there may be some uh, amount of uh, buffering that's required so that we never get starved. We, we can't allow to be starved. The question is, do we do any kind of on-the-fly uh, correction for you know, errors in the positioning of the, of the platform, things like that? No, actually we do not. Um, we require our platform to be exceedingly high resolution on its motion. So we have a platform that we can move like a one two thousandths of an inch accurately. You know, it's very, very high uh, um, resolution on that motion, yes. Yeah, so, um, so basically our, our, um, our generally our, our deadline or our, uh, our window, our biggest uh, latency that we can accept is on the order of 50 microseconds. Um, and generally speaking, the preempt RT patch will give us that, but it's not, 100% guaranteed, and so we could miss a deadline occasionally. Um, there's ways that we can recover from that in a lot of the things, like the thermal stuff, if we miss a heater control operation. The heater control operation are happening at half line cycles, so that's happening at a 120 hertz, so that's you know pretty slow. Um, anyway, so we don't really need hard real time for that. Um, but the problem is that we, uh, We've had the experience where even on the hard real-time system, on the commercial RTOS, if we're not coding the priorities right and things like that, we'll still miss a deadline. And when that happens, it's not good. Uh, we, when we were originally, a lot of this code was developed for printing solid ink uh, for color printing. So it's a similar print head and technology that's for that. Um, and if you print a bad page, well, you can kind of reprint it or something, you know, and kind of get around that. But um, this, this is not, I mean, if you, if you misprint a layer, it can leave a bad feature on it and it's not acceptable to the customer, so. Yes. So the question is, how many engineers, how many firmware developers essentially are on our team? And uh, do we require, or does Xenomai require a multi-core processor? Uh, on our team, well, originally it was, uh, Philippe was working as a kind of a consultant and it was just me. Um, and then eventually we brought in a second guy. And the two of us were able to take this extremely large legacy code base and get the whole thing running and making these beautiful prints. So we were very, it was really some of the most fun I've had. I mean, it was a great little small team and we got an amazing amount of work done in a small amount of time and it was a ton of fun. And I, by the way, I was gonna say that we all are super lucky to do what we do. This is really a great job to have is to work in embedded systems and it's so much fun. Um, the, uh, as far as the Xenomai, Xenomai would work on one core. In fact, we thought it was using all the cores of our four core processor. 
But then when we started looking at the, at the affinity, it turns out that by default, Xenomai uh, has sets the affinity to a randomly selected core. And then as you, as you spawn your threads, all the spawned threads are on that same core. So we looked and our 30 threads were all running on one core. <laughs> and it was still working fine. So we thought, well, that's, you know, maybe we could spread it out. But there was no reason to. Um, and, and then the, as far as the slicing application, yeah, we could set the, the slicer to run on the same core as the real time is and there would be no problem. I mean, it is running on this. It is running on that core as well as others. But um, we could run that slicer on a single core, and and Xenomai. That's the really great thing about Xenomai. It's, I mean, I'm writing user space code, and it looks just like user space code. It builds like user space code. I, lots of the threads I'm doing are true Linux stuff, ma manipulating files and talking to the network and doing all the things I need to do. And this is a quote unquote a Xenomai thread, but it never goes into real time space. But it's communicating with my real time threads in a very easy way. It's just a beautiful, I loved it. What, uh, what's the clock speed of your processor? You know? the, our, we were using an Intel i3, and it was running at like three and a half gigahertz. Um, it didn't need to be that fast. We were, we were doing some measurements comparing you know, what it was before and after, and it was like 10x faster on some of the stuff we were compute intensive stuff, even though it was running on only one core, it was still 10x faster than the commercial RTOS. It was like, wow, we have way too much power here. So we could dumb it down a lot. Yes? The question is, are we looking to move to like an ARM processor, cheaper uh, hardware, et cetera? And um, the answer is, I'm not allowed to talk about that. <laughs> so you can guess. <laughs> I'll, I'll... <laughs> so personally, I, I really, I'm, I don't have any problem with running on an i3. I think it's fantastic. I love it. And these printers are selling for 40K a pop. So why not? You know, why, why do we need a, to, but um, it's, I can't talk about what's going on in the labs. <laughs> Another question, yeah. Um, so, uh, no, we don't have, uh, the question is, do we have any other sensors to kind of see how the print's going along and kind of make sure that everything's, you know, correct without having a, a, a I think this is, I'm, I think I'm getting the hook. <laughs> we have a, an end game to go to, which I don't, I've never been to, but I think it's going to be fun. Uh, thank you all for coming today. Uh, thank you for your attention. And also, thank you for your contributions to open source because it's fantastic. I love it. And I want to keep using it. Thanks.